thoughts on the outlook for the market and where it intersects with the OPEC plus impasse? Well, I mean, uh, first of all, we have to recognize that um, uh, OPEC plus is basically, you know, our geniuses and they've managed to engineer the market and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but now we found out, sadly, that basically Saudi and UAE are having like this um, massive uh, fight um, and things might unravel, uh, which would not be as genius, basically. So I still revert to my view of OPEC and OPEC plus as basically the inspected clousseaus of, uh, of oil markets, you know, kind of uh, moving along haplessly, uh, banging their noses against uh, brick walls and then say, well, you know, can't go this way, so might as well go the other way. Uh, and I think they do things out of out of need than uh, quote unquote strategy. So if you look at the market right now, we've moved from that April 2020 low, uh, which can be characterized anywhere between minus 40 to plus ten dollars uh, to about on WTI about seventy seven dollars. So I think basically the easy money is done. That's where you had people saying that, <clears throat> you know, $70, $60, $50, $40, all those were impossible. We'll never get there. Everybody was talking variant, COVID, we're all going to die. We'll never be recovered. We'll never live the same lives again. Nobody will have to travel. We'll all, you know, live at home and not move and all this kind of stuff. Now all that's done. We're at $77. Everybody's like, we're going to get to $100. Uh, you know, everything's coming back again. Yee hee, here we go. Yes, ready, blah, blah, blah. So we are basically out. We sit on the sidelines. That's not to say I don't think that the market can't tick a little bit higher, maybe get from, you know, the high at 76, 98, maybe to 77, 78, even 85. But I think the kind of, quote unquote, easy money uh, is done. When you start having basically people who are bearish become bullish, I think basically that's a negative sign for the market. Having said that, I think the rest of the markets, whether you look at equities um, or uh, measure of risk appetite, which is basically Bitcoin. I think those will rise. Uh, so it, it's a funny thing. If you look at oil on its own, I think that's pretty much uh, done. If you look at oil um, in with the rest of the markets, those are just basically starting their kind of last legs up. Whereas oil, you can actually say it's actually finished that last leg up. So it's going to be very interesting to see what, what happens. So you're there saying is. regardless of the OPEC dance at the moment, this was already going to reach its sort of peaking point? Yeah, I think basically, you know, whatever happens with OPEC and OPEC plus and, and those discussions, I mean, seriously, it's like, um, you know, the, the, these are markets. This is, this is real money. This is uh, profit and loss. This is a multi-billion, not to say trillion dollar, in, uh, you know, uh, market. And really what happens between the UAE and, um, and, uh, and Saudi Arabia and a fight between whatever you want to call it, personalities, egos, all this kind of stuff, nobody gives a shit, I mean, to be honest. Well, perhaps somebody in Lebanon gives a little bit of a one in order to give us a comment nonetheless. Lori Hitayan, MENA Director, Natural Resource Governance Institute, uh, a well-respected commentator on the geopolitics of the Middle East. Lori, what's going on, do you think, within Saudi Arabia and the UAE? My, as ultimately, the sort of question mark seems to be, is this purely an OPEC plus oil quota issue? Or is the latest sort of standoff between Riyadh and Abu Dhabi part of a wider trend line that's been going on for the last two years? Your thoughts on its outlook? So uh, for the time being, I guess it's all about uh, oil and the future of oil uh, globally and in the region. Uh, as you know, the we, can, we, we cannot deny anymore the impact of energy transition on anyone, even on the low-cost producers as, uh, uh, as the producers in, in the region. Everybody knows that this energy transition is real, the impact is real, and everybody wants to think about the future. And this is where this whole issue comes in. You know, everybody, Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, all the rest in the region uh, want to make sure that even though they're the last man standing in this oil business, uh, they are low-cost producers, they have vast reserves, they can stand uh, till the end to provide the markets, but at the same time, they need to uh, fast enough, diversify their economies, have a stronger economy that is, that is not based on oil and gas, more sustainable, 
for the future generations, uh, optimize the revenues now until they can, until 2030, 35, 40, 50, 2050, so that they are able to uh, live beyond the oil era. And You're essence, saying, in essence, that the energy transition, given the uh, need to build a new economy, is putting UAE and Saudi more into competition than into allies, which they were through the oil era. Is that so? Today, it is uh, today. It is putting the uh, it, today UAE is putting that on the table. Like we need guys to. Uh, optimize our revenues. We need to make benefit now. We cannot wait another year where we do have this control over quotas. We want to uh, to optimize and to maximize uh, our capacities uh, production-wise, making money, uh, put it in the right place to build our economy stronger for the future, for whatever it is coming in the future. So today, the UAE, timing-wise, today they felt that this is the right time for them. For Saudi Arabia, they see that Let's continue rescuing whatever we've done. Let's benefit from all the, the uh, if you want, the sacrifices that we've done last year. And let's continue for a couple of months more. And then we, uh, we can uh, think of what will happen. I think it's timing. Uh, UAE does want to deal, about, uh, the, to deal with this uh, now and not later. So, uh, and put it on the table, basically. Uh, now that the extension issue came up and they wanted to extend beyond April 20. Uh, 22. Uh, so this is, this is a, a, we shouldn't be reading it beyond uh, that. We shouldn't be reading it as a rivalry between the politics of the UAE and politics of, of Saudi Arabia. I think more than anything today, Saudi Arabia, UAE, they want to have this strong economy in their countries that would go uh, beyond the oil, uh, oil uh, era. So I just put it uh, in that, uh, in that uh, context now. Okay, let's uh, go across to Venezuela this morning to Jose Shalhoub, political risk and oil analyst, of course, Venezuela. The world holds still, I believe, the wor- regarded as holding the world's largest oil reserves, but of course we know has been spectacularly uh, suffering in, in, as an industry over the last decade or so. But Jose of the different challenges facing OPEC at this time and the oil market is the idea of new supply. And it would appear that Venezuela seems to be able, it's starting to add incrementally more and more barrels over recent months. What's the state of play in the Venezuelan oil industry? Yes, thank you, Sean. Thank you for the the invitation. Uh, Well, uh, yes, well, since the last time we spoke, uh, things haven't changed uh, much, you know. Yes, uh, according to recent news and reports and all that, yes, the you know PDVSA, Petróleos de Venezuela, the state oil company, has been able to lift up a little bit of its you know current you past oil production rate, but it's not re- it's not even reaching the million barrels per day. Okay, uh, if you will, uh, their rate of production today hardly reaches the 500,000 barrels per day from being p- producing like in 2004 or even before that, be- before the onset of the Bolivarian revolution, three, 3.5, 3.8 millions of barrels per day. I mean, it's, it, it pales in comparison to those, to, to that amount of barrels, you know? But yes, I mean, today the, uh, the average of production, it's around 450, 490, maybe 500,000, but, but that's it. That, I mean, uh, is there uh, anything to point towards a, a conversation between Caracas and Washington that there could be any way to rehabilitate that relationship to allow investment to come back into the oil industry during the Biden administration? Not likely. For not not likely. I mean, uh, uh, in recent weeks, uh, it was known that the U.S. was to, uh, you know, keep the sanctions in place for six more months. Uh, it's good to remind you and the and the panelists that we we're going to have uh, municipal elections, regional regional elections in the next November twenty first. Uh, it, it, you know, they're going to be a, cru- a crucial election because uh, Maduro and the government has been uh, insisting in trying to uh, push for the, this new Biden administration to lift sanctions, promoting new 
you know, met political measures and, and, and trying to show more openness to the opposition, you know, even though if they are cosmetic or trying to uh, reflect some minor changes, but not likely. I mean, uh, I think the Biden administration is trying to wait for more visible change in the political area. Uh, and I think the crucial moment will be the, this, this next elections to try to see uh, what uh, the Maduro government will be, will be doing. But I don't think that PDVSA will be able to, to lift, you know, to recover its production unless there's, I mean, there, there could be massive investments, which I don't think it will be likely for the next, I don't know, uh, two years or so. Omar, some of the challenges to the demand question, ultimately, we've talked a little bit about the supply issue. Uh, clearly, the Venezuela may or may not add a few barrels. Uh, the shale producers may or may not come back. But from a demand side, it does appear that COVID is making a return in 70 countries now. Since the end of June, infection rates are rising. And there is a big demand for expected recovery and the oil price built on a big demand recovery in the second half. What are your views of where those two things go together, that the oil price has a baked in demand recovery in the second half and it doesn't arrive because COVID resurges? Your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, you know, let's say COVID resurges, how that has has an effect or a, a measurable effect on demand, um, I don't really see. So is it that people will drive less? Is it that economies will basically, uh, you know, uh, go into complete lockdown and all, you know, businesses will shut like they did before? I don't think so. Um, are we seeing basically more reopenings? Did Anybody watch the football at Wembley and, uh, you know, all these people, uh, you know, in the crowd and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so, no. Is it possible that we get basically <clears throat> a new deadlier COVID uh, strain that will come and decimate the world? Yes. Is it possible that we get struck by a meteorite? Yes. But is it probable to both those? The, the answer is no. Is it possible? Definitely. Is it probable? No. So, basically, I think people uh, put their money where things are probable as, as opposed to where things are, are possible. Uh, and if you go back to the, uh, the question about oil and, uh, you know, uh, the transition, all this kind of stuff, uh, sadly, the, the Middle East has been trying to transition from oil-based economies since, I think, at least 1970, if not 1950. Uh, they haven't done so and they won't do so. The other question is, if oil is basically cheap, to transition, you have to basically spend the money in terms of subsidy. You have to subsidize all this uh, uh, green energy. You've got to pay people uh, to buy electric cars or make them extremely cheap by subsidizing them. You've got to pay people uh, to you know, use solar panels or whatever it is. It's, it's, it's basically a subsidy game. So I don't see this kind of <clears throat> you know, oil uh, uh, disappearing. Um, I mean, it's very interesting, but you can actually, uh, oil is energy. You could use energy in a million and one ways. Uh, the only question is, is it in vogue or is it not? You know, uh, in terms well, the of the point that Laurie was making, and I'd welcome your thoughts on it, that the transition uh, uh, propels, let's say, Saudi Arabia's announcement six months ago, all multinationals operating in the Middle East who wants to do business with the Saudi government has to put their regional headquarters in Riyadh, which in essence is a direct competition to Dubai, which has ultimately been the commercial hub for 30 years. That type of sort of incremental steps towards building a new economy can bring what were aligned economies, Saudi and the UAE, into now being slightly more competition. Do you see that as playing into what is behind this current decision, that no. it's a little bit wider? Man, sure. But, but, but at the end of the day, what happens between the, U, U, the UAE and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the Saudi economy, at the end of the day, who cares? They're so tiny. One's got a population of, I think, 30 million. The other one has a population of 
um, um, I mean, um, a local population of maybe like, I don't know, 500,000, a million. I don't know what it is. Well, I'd argue you care because 4 million barrels of idle supply sits in between those two countries. And there is very few countries left within the OPEC 20, OPEC plus 20 that are relevant at this stage. Saudi Arabia, UAE, maybe Kuwait, maybe one or two others that are actually in the ability or willingness to adjust supply in order to uh, affect price. Uh, from the point of view of that position, they, they're perhaps important. Yeah, I mean, definitely they can basically move the price down. But that's like saying that, you know, I could, I could basically cause trouble for my family by jumping off a cliff. Yeah, sure. If they want to jump off a cliff, nobody can stop them. But it's an irrational thing to do. Will they do it? I think not. But the point is that if oil prices get cheaper, you will find it much more difficult to do this kind of quote unquote energy transition because the amount of money that you would have to pay to incentivize or, 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 or pay for that transition is going to be absolutely gigantic. And there will always be a demand for cheap energy, always, whether it be in um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Far East, whether it be for mining uh, bloody Bitcoin or whatever it is. You, it's, it's not, you can't legislate again you can't tell people look there's product a and product b you have to use product b because it's more expensive everybody will use product a unless you pay them to basically go with with product b so it's, well that's it's what's happened in news overnight lori in saudi arabia they are capping uh, the 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 price of gasoline at the pump but lori i wanted your thoughts the other area of obviously supply uh, potential in the second half that could sort of curtail i'm i'm sort of trying to get at the answer to the question as to why the oil markets have reacted rather mutedly, rather calmly to this OPEC impasse. And my sense is that there's a lot of supply available, even if you take it from inventories. But the other area is, will they do a deal with Iran or will they not? And what's your outlook on those talks at this point with the new administration coming into Tehran? Yeah, so I think basically, as you said, like everybody thinks first that there will be a deal, not swiftly, but in due time with the, with the UAE and the Saudi Arabia. So that is calming the market that definitely they will come up with a solution in due time. And definitely the other, as you mentioned, the supply issue, because everybody was saying end of year definitely will be having Iranian oil coming back. Uh, so we're not sure if end of year this will be uh, coming. What we know today, it's like um, there is no set date for the uh, next round of uh, meeting. Uh, they were saying early July. Now we're in early July. Next week is Eid, so everybody will be going to Eid. And after that, it will be very short, maybe before the 4th of August when uh, Raisi comes in uh, and uh, takes over. So I'm, I'm not sure unless they have been doing like uh, under the radar talks and agreeing, which I, I'm not sure, I doubt. So that's why I think that this deal will be left to the Raisi uh, government administration uh, uh, to, uh, to negotiate. Uh, there were a lot of discussions that everybody, even the, the, uh, the new president, Raisi, wanted this uh, current government, the Rouhani government, to do the deal so that they can blame them if it didn't go well, or if it went well, they would benefit from all the uh, good things happening and opening up of the uh, economy, et cetera. So I, I'm not sure that it, we will be able, uh, they will be able to come up with a solution before the 4th of August. So that will be left for after the 4th of August. So I think that uh, it might take time. So that's why I'm not sure anymore. You see that in the end region. Of year, end of year, we might have Iranian, uh, oil coming back. I'm not sure today if that will happen by end of this year. Do you th in the region, uh, there's obviously been a lot of uh, opposition to the rehabilitation of the JCPOA from the, obviously Israel, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, not very keen. Uh, Washington obviously has uh, uh, those on the Republican side against it. Is there that force against Biden's sort of initiative starting to weigh on its likelihood of happening, do you think? Just the politics on this side rather than the politics on Iran's side. You know, you know there are other factors as well. Like when, the, uh, when in Iraq, the bases, the American bases are constantly being attacked. So this is another... Uh, Another alarm, alarming factor for the for the uh, for the Americans to think of is is this helping the negotiations or this is escalating? It's an escalation move. 
So again, like this is what they're seeing. So if we give away easily and uh, so the, and the, the Iranians are back and they have more money, are they going, going to continue supporting the proxies, which is like many, many in the region are seeing it that way. So an Iranian come back uh, to the economy and the oil, uh, oils, uh, Iranian oil coming back, that means a lot of money. That means proxies will be supported again. So this is one factor that is really being, that is, uh, on the table, or this is like the, the concerning factor. On the, on, but, but at the same time, you know that we, we, we all remember that there were discussions, bilateral discussions between Iranians and Saudi Arabia. So now there are talks that maybe Oman will be taking over from, uh, from Iraq uh, to take over the discussions. You know, Oman has perfect relations with Iran, well, they were the, the sort of the midwife of the first round of JCPOA. It seems to me the longer it goes on and if it drifts towards the end of the year into January, that the U.S. politics cycle gets back to the midterm elections. It'd be very difficult for Biden to make anything that resembles a concession. So if this deal isn't done soon, I wouldn't be too optimistic. Jose, South America, a place we don't hear about very often in our neck of the woods, ultimately been challenged by COVID like everybody else. What's the current outlook at the moment for the economies of South America to step up and recover like we're seeing slowly but surely in North America and in Europe? You're on mute, Jose. Sorry, you're on mute. I'm sorry about that. Well, South America certainly is in a very problematic situation. I mean, because of this COVID-19, uh, because of the low vaccination rates in most of the countries, uh, unlike Chile, for example, Chile has had the you know the highest vaccination rates in all the region. Uh, we have seen Brazil has, which has been hardly hit uh, by the COVID nineteen, uh, and especially due to the political unrest uh, going on. And I mean that started even before the COVID-19 on, on set in 2019 in different countries in the region. Now we are seeing in Cuba uh, that, you know, uh, re, uh, according to recent news, been many protests going on in, in the island. In Haiti, the recent killing of the president. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the outlook for the region is not really good, at least for the rest of the year, uh, because it needs to recover. Uh, uh, as a region mainly dependent on the commodity and commodities experts, mainly of oil, gas. Does this create an opportunity in the vacuum of the U.S. involvement that the Chinese can make further inroads into their commercial and political relationship with South America? Yes, depending on the, you know, on the position to be taken by the Biden administration, maybe some redirection redirectioning of its foreign policy. Now we are seeing that the, you know, the, the this current administration is retiring from Afghanistan, for example. Uh, so it, it will be, you know, it will be depending on the priorities setting by, by this current White House. But yes, this, this you know, creates a, a, an opportunity for, for, for Washington to uh, relaunch its relationship with the region. It would be Absolutely. interesting to see if they shake that, because clearly the Chinese see that as a great opportunity uh, and obviously a very big market with lots of resources and also apparently ready to pour into Afghanistan. Let's go to the survey and give everybody a chance in the room to comment on the themes we've been discussing this morning, particularly interested in this issue of COVID-19 infections rising in 70 countries. We're seeing daily infection rates pointing accelerating high in 10 days in Holland, they went from under a thousand a day to a ten thousand a day. Uh, the big question, of course, is will these infection rates convert into hospitalizations and mortality, and then impact economic recovery? So, my, will this curtail the expected demand recovery in Q3? Will this uh, resurgence of COVID uh, impact the massive demand recovery that has to come in the second half of this year in order? to uh, meet that, uh, I, I think, to a certain extent, the baked-in oil price. Omar, Monday morning, the week ahead, OPEC plus ahead of Eid. Any thoughts? Where does the market go this week? Yeah, so basically we started, uh, we started rising in April 2020 when COVID was not coming off, but COVID was surging. Yes. So if, 
if you imply a correlation that cases are rising and therefore markets go down, um, I think that's I, I think that's a difficult one to uh, to carry. Okay, because if well, cases at- rising, economies may be forced into further lockdown postures. Again, when we were in April 2020 and everything was locked down tighter than whatever, what did the stock market do? And what did oil prices do? They went up. It's because oil prices and markets look forwards. They look for basically the worst and basically say, right, it can't get any worse, right? So now what you have is people having been, lots of people having been infected, some people having unfortunately died, and a lot of people having been vaccinated. So to expect now that it's going to get really bad again would again be possible, but not very probable. So I think, you know, you've had that same. You've had the alpha, beta, delta, gamma, lambda, blah, blah, blah. And it's just going to keep going. And they're going to keep, it's like, it's like the Iran story. Are, we gonna, are they going to do a deal? It's just, it's a done deal in March, then in April, then May, then June, then before they take, then July, then August, then September, the next year. Well, and what are they negotiating about? Iran has said, accept all our demands or nothing. So there's no negotiation. There's no talking. There's no back room. There's no nothing. Uh, and the same with OPEC. OPEC is the same. Are they going to do it? Will they say? Are they going to? And the market just keeps going and kind of focus on basically numbers, economies, stuff that makes sense. And if you want to talk about, you know, who's the better person, is it, is it uh, you know, Saudi Arabia's crown prince, I don't know, and the ruler of I don't know where and who's better. I mean, you know, I, I don't really mind. They can do whatever they want as long as the market does what I As think long as they keep 8 million barrels a day off the market and get, keep it nice <laughs> and healthy, they manage it into uh, upward motion. Laura, your thoughts the week ahead, anything you'll be paying particular attention to? So the week ahead, I guess this week, uh, nothing in particular. And I think everybody's looking for the Aid and to take a break, I guess. Uh, so uh, nothing nothing in uh, particular. No particular optimism that there'll be a rush to a solution here at, at OPEC Plus and that Saudi or, or rather Russia apparently are going to be the, the moderating force. Look, uh, no news is good news, right? So as okay. long as they don't go on TV and... Uh, uh, talk to each other through media, I think it's a good sign. It means that something is cooking behind the door. So, And just, that- Laurie, a quick update on Lebanon going, it seems, increasingly into more difficult circumstances. Yes. So I'm lucky today that I didn't have an electricity cut yet. So maybe in, like in a couple of seconds, I might have the electricity cut. And generators are cutting as well because it is being really difficult to complement the the uh, short uh, short uh, the, uh, the the shortages of the uh, electricity uh, yeah. so it is really becoming very hard to live in beirut and in lebanon actually so hopefully uh, will uh, hopefully the, uh, the uh, people in charge of this country will become uh, more responsible people and save the lives of the people living here because it's really becoming un- unbearable for the people. And there's no obvious savior coming over the hill, the IMF, the World Bank, the Americans, the Saudis. Look, we need to save ourselves first, right? Help yourself so that we can help you. This is what Ludria had said uh, like months ago. Help yourself so that we can help you. Nobody here, no politician wants to save anyone. So they're only trying to say uh, to survive and save their seats and their positioning in the country, unfortunately. So, uh, so I worse before it gets better. Outcome. It's. I mean, you always think in some ways that Beirut, uh, Lebanon has hit the low and it finds somehow a new low. Uh, let's go to the survey result and give Jose the last word today from Caracas. Uh, the answer to the survey on a sort of three to one is, will this curtail expected demand recovery in Q3? Yes, is an overwhelming sense in this particular room. Uh, that might be a buy for Omar, but a sell for others. Uh, Jose, uh, your closing thoughts, obviously, uh, the U.S., North America, South America, outlook for this week. Is there anything particular on the horizon? You're on mute again, Jose. We don't get to hear from you often, but when you're on, we want to hear you. You're still on mute. Maybe it's uh, the authorities have decided they're going to mute that Jose guy. Is that that enough? Have we lost you? Jose, can you unmute? There you go. 
the final word with you. Thank you. Okay, I will keep uh, regarding the region. I will keep my 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 watch in Cuba and uh, the latest developments in Cuba, and of course the rest of you know the rest of, of the region. How the U.S. will react to 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 the latest developments in the island, and of course how how the Venezuelan government will be watching these latest developments as you know. Uh, <laughs> Just brief the as quickly on what the latest developments you're referring to. This assassinated in Haiti. In, no, in Cuba, in Cuba, Cuba. the latest protests in, uh, across the islands demanding more, you know, a better treatment of the COVID nineteen, better right. wages, right against the uh, Diaz Canel government. So, yeah, uh, the most the most massive protests in in Cuba in the I don't know in the last fifty years. Okay. So I will keep my 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 special watch on that on these developments. Do you think there's more to the assassination of Haiti? Is there some sort of bigger story here? Yes, kind of, kind of. There, there could be, there could, there could be like a bigger picture or, uh, linking, you know, the the assassination of the former president Juvenal Moise, uh, the protests in Cuba, and the late, you know, the the recent protests across South America. So, uh, so dark there, forces as work maybe in the corridors of uh, sort of reminds me of the 1980s perhaps listen we'll wrap it up there oil markets in asia opening a little bit down today i think wandering in the search of wind as long as opec plus uh, isn't moving forward and i suppose opec plus isn't moving forward because the markets aren't compelling them to do so because they're sitting still so it's like this perfect still storm nobody's forcing the other to take any action so let's all go and eat holidays which we will be doing next week ourselves uh, but laurie thank you so much We're always praying for the better advancement of Beirut and the Lebanese people find their way. Jose, thank you for joining us from uh, Caracas today and Omar is always anchoring Monday mornings to kick off the week in Dubai. All the best. Have a great week and we'll catch up in the coming mornings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>